Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet all of you teachers. We are all colleagues. You teach. Uh, at one level, we teach uh, the students at the <laughs> college. We benefit from you. You prepare them and bring it to us. Bring them to us, and we try to finish your job. <laughs> and uh, this evening, I intend to discuss with you the history of Islam in the United States. When we talk about the history of Islam in the United States, we generally identify stages in the development of Islam in this country. The American experience is basically an experience of <coughs> immigration. People leaving one part of the globe and coming to this part of the world. From Canada to Argentina, that's the experience. Even the people we call now in America, the native people, were immigrants themselves from Asia by way of the Bering trades to the United States. We know that. That's one thing that makes this part of the world very interesting in terms of human history. And of course, Islam is a very uh, interesting religion in the sense that there is the motif of immigration. The Prophet was born in Mecca, but then he had to emigrate to Medina. Uh, there is also that motif of immigration. When the Muslims were persecuted in Mecca, he told his followers to emigrate to Ethiopia, which was a Christian kingdom. And that's part of the history of Islam. So migrating to America would be seen by some of the Muslims as parallels in terms of emigration from one point to the other. It is against this background that I would like to talk about the five stages in the evolution of the Muslim community, the making of Muslims in America, and the manner in which Islam has been institutionalized in this country. Now, the first phase which scholars who have written about Islam in this country talk about is the sketchiest part of the history, because we have limited data. And one of the pioneers who contributed to our understanding, he was not studying Islam, he was studying uh, uh, languages from the old world and their impact in the new world. Leo Weiner at Harvard. I mean, in the 20s, he wrote two volumes, more than 1,000 pages, called Africa and the Discovery of America. And the thesis of his book was really that there were people from the old world who came to America before Columbus, and they influenced the languages of the Mexican native people. It's a controversial book at the time. But in retrospect, some of the scholars now looking at the data are beginning to find circumstantial evidence that are complementing some of his findings. And what we do know is from Weiner's studies that there were some words that the Native Americans had we could be traced back to some of the languages in Northwest Africa among the Monday speaking people or the Arabic speaking people. Now, from the circumstantial evidence, what we do know is that in the Arab sources, and this is where American history, Muslim history, and African history intersect. The British historian Basil Davidson, who wrote many books, and some of you are familiar with him, Lost Cities of Africa, you know, Modern Africa, and many other books that he has written. I mean, he has been instrumental in popularizing the findings of some of the medieval Arab writers like Al-Umari. Uh, Al-Umari <coughs> recorded for posterity the information that was obtained from Mansa Musa. And many of you school teachers, I'm so familiar with Mansa Musa, who in 1324 made a pilgrimage to Mecca suggesting that there was exposure to Islam in that region of Africa where he came from. And that Mansa Musa told the historians and scholars and intellectuals he met in Cairo, because according to the accounts, I mean, his kingdom became known in the world because he was carrying so much gold and he created inflation in Cairo. And of course, the word spread and one of the cartographers in the Middle East, at the, in, in Europe, Southern Europe at the time, uh, made this big map of the world with Mansa Musa. But what we know from Mansa Musa's account, which has relevance for our study of Islam in America, is the fact that Mansa Musa reported that Mansa Abu Bakr II, his predecessor, had outfitted an expedition to travel across the Atlantic. 
Now, of course, when this evidence was presented to many of the academics who have been responsible for the canonization of American historiography, it was very difficult for many of us to accept. But you, that's what history is all about. We, we canonize history, and of course, we make it the gospel truth, and no one else can come up with evidence. But then gradually, you begin to see cracks in the wall because new evidence begin to come. And of course, in this case, Tor Heidel was able to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you could certainly travel from the Mediterranean region through the Atlantic and come to the Americas riding on boats made of reeds. And he proved that. He proved that you, can also, you, you could build a, 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 a similar kind of structure and travel across the Atlantic from West Africa and land in Cuba or in the Caribbean islands thereby dispelling the idea that people could not have done that before. Now, what is very interesting is that the Mansa Abu Bakr account, of course, we only have the account on the other side of the Atlantic, what was reported about his expedition. But we don't have any evidence <laughs> from the native sources here saying that Mansa Abu Bakr was here and that there were Arabs or people who are familiar with Islam at this end. So we do have evidence. Now, we also have evidence from the Arab sources that there were certain Muslim mariners. And there is one fellow known as Khaskas in the literature who apparently traveled from Andalusia, meaning Spain, and came across the Atlantic into the New World. These are sketchy data we have. We have people like Ivan Van Sadima, who is writing not from an Islamic studies perspective, but from an African-American black nationalist perspective, who wrote that book called They Came Before Columbus. Much of his work was really built on Weiner's study. And of course, he was able to get additional research that came out of excavation in the Caribbean and in other parts of South America to make his case in that book which was controversial in the academy. But you have uh, uh, some interesting points which reinforce what Leo Weiner raised. Yes? When did he publish Africa and the Discovery of America? I mean, that one. Weiner, yeah. his book came out in the 1920s, 1920, 20, I think 1922. Okay. Yeah, if you have that book, you know, you can get the reference there. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the point I want to make really is that we do have circumstantial evidence for this period. And we are beginning to get more and more data coming out. You, you have people like uh, Barry Feld, who has his book called Saga America, trying to suggest that there were people who came here, and in this part of the United States, there were some people who came from uh, the Middle East, the Mediterranean region, into the Americas before Columbus. Now, what we do know about Columbus is that Columbus spent many years traveling along the West African coastline before he came to the New World. Now, whether he was exposed to this story, which we now know, about Mansa Abu Bakr's expedition, we don't know. I mean, you know, like uh, there was a big controversy when we had the 500 year anniversary of Columbus. I was at a conference organized by the National Council of Churches uh, uh, right here in New Mexico, Santa Fe. And they invited a group of scholars. They had Muslim scholars, Jewish scholars, Hispanic scholars, Native American scholars, and some African American Christians uh, and uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion. But the evidence we got was more about the second phase I'm now talking about. The second phase, really, there is no controversy. We have a lot of evidence. And that is the time since Columbus came to the New World and all those other marinas from the Old World coming here. And this, of course, will be the period that corresponds from 1492 right through the period of slavery, we have a lot of evidence of Muslims coming to this part of the world. I mean, in Columbus's own expedition, you had Muslims, Estevanico and all those people. So they came, there were some Jews and some Muslims who were on board with Columbus. That one we do know, the evidence is there. We don't have any doubt about that. Now, the, 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 even though the expedition was coming from a triumphant Catholic Spain, because at that time, Ferdinand and Isabel were able to establish hegemony over the Iberian Peninsula. The last stronghold of Muslim Spain fell, Grenada. 
But the Muslims were losing since the 11th century, really, in the Andalusian Peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. 1492 is really celebrated uh, uh, as the great uh, period, and it coincided with the expedition of Columbus. But 1492 really is the culmination of a series of reversals that started since the 11th century in that region. So during this second phase, Muslims came to the New World in two ways. You had Muslims who found themselves living in the Iberian Peninsula under very difficult conditions because they were now faced with the choice of either emigrating out of uh, the Iberian Peninsula to North Africa or taking their chances and coming to the New World. There were a lot of Muslims who did that, there were a lot of Muslims and Jews who did that, they came to the New World. And of course, the history of the Southwest and the history of southern part of what is now called the United States, which was Hispanic territory, Florida and others, we have evidence of Muslim presence in these areas. Now, where the evidence is more available is of course during the time of slavery when you had at least 10% of the slaves who came out of Africa were Muslims. And people like Alan Austin, Sylvain Juf, Roger Bastide, if you go to South America, Gilberto Frey, uh, and Ignatius Etienne, and many other scholars, you know, from the Portuguese, from the Spanish, from the English, from the French. Uh, you read uh, Sylvain Juf's book, which is called Servants of Allah, Enslave Africans in the New World. I mean, and you read Alan Austin's book, African Muslims in Antebellum America, you will have a rich collection of information about Muslims who were here from the time of Columbus right up to the time when the Civil War erupted in the United States. So we have a lot of data and new, many numerous books have uh, been uh, written by scholars we have, I can just give you profile briefly, and in passing, because we don't have the time, of some of the major Muslim slaves who are known to American historians and scholars who are now writing about the Muslim experience in America. We have the most celebrated slave, uh, Muslim slave, was Ayyub ibn Suleiman Jallo, who was a prince from Bondu. But he was himself involved in the slave trade. You know, there's a, there's a twist, ironic twist here. And he landed as a slave himself in the Americas. Yes, please. Could you write that name? Those names are please. Oh, OK. <laughs> you have uh, the, he's known as Job, as in the Bible, Job ben Solomon. That's how he's known. But his Muslim name really is Ayub, Ayuba. Ibn Suleiman. Well, some people will spell Suleiman differently, but M A N. Jallo. This is his last name, Jallo. This is the French spelling. The English would say J A L L O W. But the French spelling, J so if you go to the uh, Senegal and Mali and Guinea, they have been influenced by the French, so they'll spell Jallo as D I A L L O. Now, he was a prince. There's a whole book about him that was written by someone who knew him, uh, Douglas Grant, you know, and Blewett. Thomas Blewett was the first one to write the book, but there's an other book. Uh, it's called The Fortunate Slave. It's about this fellow, this prince who ended up as a slave in America, and his story was known, and he was liberated by one of the members of the British Admiral, and of course, he, he got his freedom from Annapolis, Maryland, where he was a slave, and ended up in uh, England, where he made royalty. Uh, there's a book called Blacks in Britain. If you look at that book, you will see the story of Ayub Ibn Suleiman Jallo narrated there. And then from there, of course, he went back to the Senegambia region, where he came from, and he was very helpful to the British Africa Company in their trade connections with the African hinterland. So that was the, his story. There's another celebrated story who is now becoming legendary in terms of Muslim studies in America. And that is Yaro Mahmoud. Now his name was anglicized to Yaro Mahmoud. 
But really, uh, his name in the region in Africa where he came from, he'll be known as Yoro. The name Yaro is also there, but it's most probably his name was Yoro Mahmoud, because that will make him a Fulani, Yoro Mahmoud. Now, what is very interesting about this fellow, Yoro Mahmoud, is the fact that Yoro Mahmoud would be known in the American book, Guinness Books of Records as the oldest American ever to live in this country. Because he lived, according to Peel, the well-known uh, American artist, uh, Vincent Peel, I mean, uh, he was 134 years old. And Peel, of course, immortalized Yoro Mahmoud through the portrait he made of him. There were two portraits, one made by Peel, another one made by another artist who was a contemporary. And of course, what is remarkable about this fellow was that even though he was in captivity, he still maintained his Islam. And uh, he was engaged in zikr, which is praise singing, praising God's name. And he owned property in Georgetown. There's a whole story about that. And if you go to the Smithsonian, there's a book there called Blacks in Pre-Revolutionary America, produced by the Smithsonian Institution. And there's a chapter in that book called Maryland Muslim. It's about this fellow. Now, I was able to secure from the state archives in Maryland the papers of Manumission, that this fellow was owned by the Beale family, a prominent family in the Silver Spring area, and the Beale family manumitted him. And of course, his story now, if you look at two new books that came out, one by Alan Austin, the other one by Turner, Brian Turner, the cover of these books all carry Yoram Mahmoud's picture or photo, you know, the portrait of him. Now, uh, besides Yoram Mahmoud, we had another colorful fellow by the name of Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman was another prince who ended up as a slave in America. And there's a book by Terry Alford. Terry Alford's book on this Abdurrahman is known as Prince Among Slaves. And Abdurrahman, Rahman was a prince, and of course he was captured in battle, and he ended up in America as a slave in Natchez, Mississippi. Now what is interesting about him was the fact that because he was literate in Arabic, he was discovered by a medical doctor, Dr. Cox, who had been shipwrecked in Africa and was saved, interestingly enough, by the father of this guy. And, and this, he was a young man, and he was discovered after almost 40 years of captivity by this Dr. Cox. And Dr. Cox remembered him as the young man who was with his father, and that his father saved him when he was shipwrecked in Africa. Now, Dr. Cox was able to smuggle a letter through the American Colonization Society. And that letter ended up in the hands of the Sultan of Morocco. And it was the Sultan of Morocco who wrote to the American president at the time, Monroe, and Monroe instructed his Secretary of State, Clay, to intervene. And of course, they intervened. And Thomas Foster, who was the slave master, obliged on the condition that the man would have to leave, but he cannot take his children with him. Yes? Was there, I heard that there was a, uh, a treaty, and I just want to substantiate this with you. There was a treaty that the Moroccans had made with the Americans about Muslim slaves, that they would be uh, returned. Well, the Moroccans, were, yeah, the Moroccans there, there was an agreement. In Virginia, there was the understanding that most, I mean, slaves from Morocco would be liberated because Morocco was the first one to accept the United States. So if you were a slave from Morocco, if, they, if, they, if, if you are a Moroccan and you happen to end up in captivity, you would be freed. But that was... That applied to Moroccan. They were a very small number of people. Now, these Abdurrahman 
was the beneficiary of the Sultan of Morocco's intervention. Was and of, he Moroccan? Well, no, he was not Moroccan. But see, what, what was very interesting, you have some of those Africans who came from the Fulani groups, you see, who were invariably uh, uh, not seen as African because they were Muslim, they were literate, and all the other things that goes with it. So that was that perception that developed at that time. But the lit Terry Alford, if you, read, if you really want to know more about him, you should get a copy of Terry Alford's book, Prince Among Slaves. He's another very colorful fellow. But you have people like Saleh Bilali, who was a slave in South Carolina. You have the Sapilo Islands of the Georgia coast and of the Carolina coast. Now what was interesting about him was he was one of those slaves who was appointed to be an overseer. And he was able to keep records using Arabic, to keep records. In, on the plantation. And of course, uh, Saleh Bilali's great-grandchildren remembered him when the FDR established the FPA, WPA, the work project that was started by FDR. So most of those Americans who at that time were writers or journalists who didn't have employment, they went around the country recording a lot of things. So one of the stories that they recorded was about the descendants of Saleh Bilali, who reported about their grandparents and great-grandparents and some of the residues of Islam, because they buried their dead facing the east, and the kids reported some accounts. This we now have in the records, so if someone is particularly interested in that. Now, there are many other stories, and if you're really interested in these stories, you can read Alan Austin's book, which is over 700 pages. He was able to do a great deal for scholarship by collecting all these literary fragments about slaves, Muslim slaves. And his book is known as African Muslims in Antebellum America. He has two versions. You have the source book, which collect all the sources. And then he also has a paper bag, which is a smaller one, giving the narratives about each of these slaves. Now, of course, before him, you have people like Philip Corton, uh, who was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for many years. Now he's at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Philip Corton uh, edited a volume called Africa Remembered. And it has the narrative of slaves, not only Muslims. There were some Muslims, but many of them were not Muslims. Uh, Equino and all those other slaves' narratives in that book. So you have a body of literature about the slave experience. I think we have a lot of information. School teachers can now go to the library. They have a lot of information about this period. The scholars have generated a lot of material. So one could really have lesson plans, and you can talk about Muslim slaves in America. And it's becoming moving from the footnotes to the text. That's one thing that scholarship is about, you see. When we have limited data, you end up as a footnote. As we get more data, you end up in the text, you see. So that's what's happening. And of course, school teachers play a very important role in that. That's the, in terms of moving you from the footnote to the text. I mean, now the, the, what, the third phase in the history of Islam, we have a lot of data also. So there's no controversy uh, uh, on this third phase in the history of Islam in America. And that is the coming of the immigrants. Now, the construction of the Suez Canal and the movement of the Yankee traders from Boston and all that area, Rhode Island, New York, going towards the rest of the world with the construction of the Suez Canal after the end of the Civil War in the United States, we have some interesting developments. Christian Arabs, Armenians, and a number of other groups that were minorities within the Ottoman Empire began to immigrate to the United States. The Christian Arabs, some of them running from the draft in the Ottoman, ended up in New York, ranging from Massachusetts all the way to Baltimore, to the point that you see in a place like Baltimore, those who were selling greens were known as Arabs. So I mean, you know, like uh, and you know, like the, the the I mean, of course, now you have many African Americans doing that, but the old name Arab. You see, so I mean, you know, like the interesting thing is those Christian Arabs who came were following the footsteps of the Jewish immigrants who came out of the Ottoman Empire, and they were engaged in peddling. 
Now, the Jewish peddler was preceded in American business. If you read the history of business in America, small business in America, the Jewish peddler was preceded by the Yankee peddler. So you have the Yankee peddler, the Jewish peddler, the Christian Arab peddler, and then the Muslim Arab following the footsteps of the Christian Arab peddler. That's the pattern of immigration. Now, what is very interesting is that these Muslim peddlers belong to that group of Muslims who at the beginning were very hesitant to emigrate to the United States. There is the famous story in the literature of a Lebanese in 1900 who went to Beirut Harbor and he asked the American captain, Captain, do they have mosque in America? The captain said, no, he jumped off the boat. I always tell Muslims that if he was given a dream to know what will happen in 90 years, that there would be over 1,500 mosques in America within that span of time, he would have come, but he didn't come. But more daring Arab Muslims from Palestine, from Syria, from Lebanon mainly, came to America and they immigrated. So the Christian Arabs and the Muslim Arabs came from various villages. In some cases, villages were virtually transplanted in America. And of course, those Arab immigrants who came into the United States settled in the eastern seaboard, but then gradually they began to move to the hinterland, taking with them peddling. So you have the Arab peddlers in the Midwest, Toledo, Ohio, Dearborn, Michigan, which is the mecca of Arab culture in America. If you want your best sis kebab at Baglabas, you go there. And of course, some of these peddlers went to North Dakota, South Dakota, Indiana, Ross, Dakota, interestingly enough, far in the hinterland of America, and the distinction of the first place where Muslims had Juma prayer, organized in Ross, North Dakota. Now, many of these uh, 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 Arab Muslims interacted with their Christian Arab predecessors in New York and the Jewish peddlers. Now, this was before the Arab-Israeli conflict because that time they were cousins. They were real cousins in those days. So that's one of the reasons why if you look at the book of nicknames that were published before the 60s, you will come across one of the American Muslim trivia now. I use that as an American Muslim trivia. And that is because of the Muslim, Christian, and Jewish Arabs who live in Brooklyn, New York, and in New York City, Manhattan, you have the first American president to have a Muslim nickname in America. And that was Teddy Roosevelt, among all the nicknames he had. He had one Muslim nickname. He was known as Harun Rashid Roosevelt. And the reason why he was called Harun Rashid was because when he was one of the commissioners of police in New York, this was because before he became president, he used to go to Canal Street where you have all these peddlers with their cats pushing along and he would inspect the, these places. Because you have some very bad neighborhoods in those days. So they gave him the nickname Harun Rashid. And you know, like of course, during the Gulf War to bring history from the past to the present, the Kuwaitis heard about this story. So they decided that they were gonna make George Bush, the second American president, to be, to have a Muslim nickname. So they call him Abdullah Bush. And of course, that enters the box today. So the scholars will now add Bush with that nickname, Abdullah Bush. So I mean, you know, like, uh, they, 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 this is, part of the American historical trivia. And it's part of this third phase in the history of Islam in America, when the Arabs were now coming into America and were beginning to settle along the Eastern seaboard and then going into the hinterland of the United States. Besides the Arabs who came, there were people from South Asia, what we now call Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. They were all under the British Raj. Now again, just like the Arab Christians, setting the pace for the Arab Muslims. The same thing happened in the subcontinent. The Sikhs from Punjab were the first pioneers from the subcontinent to come to America. But they did not come to America just like that. They came by way of Philippines to Canada. And that's one of the reasons why if you look at the pattern of settlement today, you see that the Sikhs are now settled 
on the northwestern part of the United States and Canada. You see them in Vancouver. There's a large contingent of Sikhs in Vancouver, and you find some of them in Seattle coming down towards California. You know, so these Punjabi Sikhs inspired the Punjabi Muslims to come to America. And today you have a very interesting phenomena in America. There's a new book that just came out that was edited by Levinson and Ambla, you know, called American Immigrant Cultures. It's a fascinating book. And some of the school teachers, you should try to get in two volumes. American Immigrant Cultures. All the ethnic groups in America are documented in that book. What is striking in that, about that book is the fact that in that book, one of the outcomes of the immigration of the Punjabis or the South Asian Muslims into the United States by way of the western part of the United States is the emergence of a new ethnic group in American history. And that is the Punjabi Mexicans. Among the Hispanics, there is a subgroup called the Punjabi Mexicans. These are Mexicans of Pakistani or Indian descent. Their mothers were uh, Chicanos, Chicanas, and their parents, their fathers were from the subcontinent, from Punjab. So in that book and in the lit literature, you will have this confluence of Chicana culture and South Asian culture. Yes. Where exactly are they concentrated? They are in Stockton, Stock California. And El Centro. El Centro too. Well, you are from California, you know them. There's, Stockton, El Centro. Uh, there's a lot in the Imperial Valley. And when I, because I went to school there, there were all these people named Lydia Mohammed uh -huh. and, you know, Juan uh, Rashid. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I asked them, and it was farmers that came uh, at the, in 1920s. Uh, to build the Great American Canal and and uh, do the agricultural work there, and they married Mexican women, and they actually established a mosque in El Centro. It was one of the first mosques in California. Uh, but most of their children, when they died off, the mothers never converted. They were Catholic, so when they died off, uh, the children reverted back to Catholicism. So most of them are Catholic. There's also a group of Sikhs in the so you, you get the, the, this part of American ethnography, I mean, and immigration. Now, beside the South Asians, because once, of course, the, the South Asians started coming here from Punjab, later on, of course, during the Cold War, these are the Muslims I call the children of the Cold War. Uh, during the Cold War, after World War II, and we will come to this phase, I just want to give you a slice of that many Muslims from Asia, I mean, came to America. And we will come to that stage in the migration. The third group that migrated into America during this third phase of American history were the Muslims from Southern Europe. Now, until the Bosnian crisis, many Americans didn't know that they were Muslims in Southern, from Southern Europe. I mean, but these were Muslims who found themselves in areas which were previously part of the Ottoman Empire. Because remember now, part of Hungary, where parts of Hungary, parts of uh, uh, what we now call Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, were all within the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And Muslims who migrated from the Balkans came from what we now call Bosnia, Herzegovina, which was part of what later became Yugoslavia. Uh, some of the Muslims came out of Croatia, even though, you know, Croatians basically are Catholics. I mean, but there were some Muslim Croatians. And you have Muslims who came from Albania. Even though Albania is majority Muslim, but there are Christians. So and they focus more on their ethnicity than on their religious identity. Now, those Muslims who came from Southern Europe, some live in Thrace in Greece. You know, you still have Muslim minorities in Greece. Most of those Muslims from Macedonia, you go to Macedonia, you have many of those Macedonians are Muslim. That's why the name Macedonia is very controversial uh, uh, in the United States. If you look at this book, I'm just telling you, uh, will the real Macedonians stand up? That's a big fight. So, and you know, like because of the history of the region, and that's why the Greeks don't like the Macedonians to call themselves the Republic of Macedonia, because they'll be stealing the heritage of Alexander the Great from them. So that's the history. But 
the, from a point of view of migration, really, what we're trying to show as academics is the fact that in Southern Europe, you did have a Muslim presence, and those Muslims immigrated into the United States, whether they came as Bulgarians, whether they came as Macedonians, Albanians, or very tiny portion of the Greek population, or they came into the United States as Poles. Because you have Muslims who came from Poland. These are the descendants of Genghis Khan. And in the 20s, they dominated the biscuit industry in New York. Those Polish Muslims, the descendants of Genghis Khan, who came to America. And of course, because the Polish royalty used to use these tatters to help them in their fights against the Baltic Sea states, you know, Estonia and all those other areas. That's part of the history. And then you have those Ruthenian Muslims. These are Muslims from Ukraine, what is now called Ukraine. These are, you, and they were concentrated in New York City. In the 1890s, some of these Muslims who later be known in the literature as Ruthenian Muslim from Ukraine uh, became actively involved in America. So you have those Muslims from Southern Europe or who came from Central Europe into the United States. And then you have Muslims who came from Central Asia, the Uzbeks, the Tajikis, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. Those are Muslims who are the children of the Cold War. They were fleeing from communism. Many of them are Persian speaking or Turkey speaking groups. And they migrated to Turkey and from Turkey, since they are the children of the Cold War, the United States government was willing to allow them to come to America. And they came to America. And of course, these people have already been Slavonized. Just like the Southern and Central European Muslims. And you see, until the Bosnian crisis, many Americans didn't know that some of the neighbors, and even some of those people like uh, uh, Hamza was talking about, these uh, Punjabi Mexicans, whose grandparents, or even their parents, were from South Asia, but their mothers were Chicanas. They have names like Juan Muhammad. I mean, you know, like, uh, they didn't know that, they, have, they didn't know where their names come from. The same thing happened with many of these Americans whose parents came from Muslim background. Their grandfather was a Polish Muslim, but he came to New York and he disappeared. You have names like Adamski, Barakovich, Islamovich, Malinsky. You know, many of those names, you see, Adam, uh, 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 you know, you, you have uh, Adamovich, Muhammadovich, you see, Barakovich, Sadovsky. These are all Muslim names, Sadar, you see, I mean, you know, like they become. So you have many Americans who have Muslim ancestors, but they don't even know, because now they are Christians, or they be Jewish, you see what I'm saying, because their, their, their roots are, are lost. And this did happen even with the Arabs who came here in the 20s. They melted into what I call the American name, ocean of names and faces. So, I mean, you know, like, uh, and this is what happened to some of those European Muslims who came into America from Poland, from Greece, from Albania, from Bosnia, and many of these other places in the United States. Now, besides these Southern European or Central Asian Muslims, we had Muslims who came from China. These are also children of the Cold War because many of those Muslims who came from China came from Hunan, Hunan province, which is a predominantly Muslim province. Uh, many of them were part of the Kuomintang army of Chiang Kai-shek. After Chiang Kai-shek was defeated by Mao Zedong 50 years ago, those Muslims who were part of the Chiang Kai-shek armed forces who came from Yunnan, which is a, still in China, is a Muslim, predominantly Muslim province in China, they went to Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai in Thailand. And since Thailand became a very important American base in the Cold War, many of them were able to travel from Thailand to come to the United States as refugees and as immigrants. So you now have a very, very tiny portion of the Chinese immigrants in the United States who are Muslims. And if you go to California, Hamza is not here, but if you go to California, you will find that in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, you may find halal restaurants run by Chinese Muslims. So, so you have, you know, it's a very, America is a very interesting society. I mean, you know, like you have all kinds of people here. If you look very closely, you have all kinds of people here. Now, besides these Chinese Muslims from Southeast Asia, you have Burmese Muslims, you have Muslims from Viet Vietnam, Champa, 
in Vietnam was a Muslim kingdom in Vietnam. And of course, many of these Champa Muslims were very much identified with America during the war against the Viet Cong. And of course, they were seen as collaborators and they fled and came to America. So within the Vietnamese population, there is a very, very small portion of Vietnamese who are Muslims. And they are the Champa Muslims. You find them in California, you find them in Texas, and in Northern Virginia. And of course, besides these Vietnamese or the Cambodian Muslims or the Burmese Muslims, you have Muslims from Indonesia and Malaysia who also emigrated into the United States. So they are the Muslim presence within the Southeast Asian immigrants in the United States. Now, besides these Muslims who came from uh, that part of the world, you had Muslims, of course, who came from the Caribbean. These are mainly of Indian descent who were in Guyana, in Trinidad, and who immigrated from those points into the United States. Now, when we talk about the fourth phase in the history of Muslims, this coincided with the domestication of Islam. The first American we know in history who took an active part and about whom we know a lot was Alexander Russell Webb. He was the first white American to embrace Islam. And he represented Muslims at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893. He was a journalist, he was a member of the Theosophical Society, and he was the US Consul General in Manila, Philippines in the 1890s. But he became a Muslim in the 1890s, over 100 years ago, and he had contact with some of the rich Muslims in India, British India, and came to New York, Manhattan, and established an office there and a publishing house. And he published the first major Muslim publication called The Muslim World in the United States. Now, Webb would set the stage. Did you write his name on the book? Yes. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, Muhammad, I think I can put it here. Muhammad. Alexandra Russell Webb. You will come across this fellow uh, in the literature. I mean, and Webb tried his very best to plant Islam in America. He published the first major uh, 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 publication, the mother of all magazines and journals produced in America, was started by him. And he wrote a book called Islam in America. And that book, which was published in 1893, was the first book ever published by a Muslim in this country, talking about Islam in America at that time. Now, uh, Webb, of course, went to India, British India, and gave lectures. There are people now who are pulling his lectures together to publish them for the benefit of scholars and people who are interested. Now, Webb planted the seed of Islam in American uh, society in New York. And then, of course, many Islamized groups or heretical non Islamic groups gradually took root within the African American community. You had a fellow by the name of Timothy Drew from North Carolina who had immigrated to New Jersey area who was somehow exposed to some of these Masonic literature, some knowledge of Islam, but not correct Islam, who established the Maury Science Temple, which is a heretical group that appeared within American society, particularly in the East Coast. And yes, there are still remnants of the Maury Science Temple. One characteristic of the Maury Science Temple is that those people who are identified with their movement change their last names to Bey, B-E-Y. There's a Turkish title that was used in the Arab world, especially in Morocco and Egypt. I mean, the Turks, get, just like the British will knight you and they call you Sa Pasivin Harris. You see, the Turks also have a title. They give you a title of Pasha, P-A-S-H-A, -A, Pasha, or they call you Bey, Suleiman Bey, or Suleiman Pasha. You see, so these Turkish titles, now, this noble Drew Ali, who was an African-American from North Carolina and was somehow exposed 
to some of these cultural practices from the Muslim world, established the Maury Science Temple. And that changed the whole dress code of his followers. They dress in white, they put on the fez, the men, and the women cover their heads. And then, of course, this movement would inspire another movement that will appear among the African Americans and would receive greater attention in American society than any other within the African, African American community, and that is the Nation of Islam, which was founded by an elusive figure about whom there is still debate among scholars as to who he really was. Uh, his name was Farad Muhammad, but he has many other uh, 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 aliases. Uh, Wali Farad and all kinds of names he had. Now, this fellow would be the mentor of Elijah Muhammad. And of course, Elijah Muhammad would dominate the nation of Islam from the early 30s until his death in February 1975. And of course, out of that movement, you have a number of personalities who would have influence in American society. The most famous ones are Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and Louis Farrakhan. Uh, these are the most widely known to Americans who don't have any clue as to Islam, but they hear these names in the American media. And likely these were people who were influenced by the Nation of Islam philosophy. The Nation of Islam philosophy, of course, goes against traditional Orthodox Islamic teaching. Now we can leave the theology on aside, and if you have questions later on, we'll come to that. What I want to tell you is that when we talk about the fourth phase of Islamic development in the United States, we see how Webb introduced what I consider the Webbian understanding of Islam, which was based on orthodox Islamic teachings. But there is a heterodox understanding of Islam, which I will call the Elagian tendency. So you have in the history of Islam, the Webian as opposed to the Elagian. And of course, these two tendencies still exist within the Muslim community. And it cuts across immigrants and native born Americans. Now, besides Web, there was, um, and, 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 and Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad, there was an African American who was exposed to Orthodox Islam. Now, his relationship with Webb is problematic. None of the scholars who research this fellow, and of course he is one of the least written about fellow, but we know about him, and I had the opportunity of interviewing his wife before she died. And the, what is colorful about this couple is that Sir Dawood Faisal, who grew up in Brooklyn, and his mosque is known as the Straight Street Mosque in Brooklyn, New York, was the son, according to his alleged background, of a Moroccan, and his mother was a West Indian. Now his wife was the daughter, Sister Khadija, as she was known when she was alive, and I got the chance to interview her uh, in 1980, <laughs> I mean, she claimed to be the daughter of a Pakistani immigrant and a West Indian mother. Now, what makes them very interesting in terms of the history of Islam in the United States is that this couple were musicians. This is the connection between Islam and music in America. And if you read Dizzy Gillespie, I'm sure you know Dizzy Gillespie, if you read his autobiography, To Be or Not To Bop, <laughs> because they were the, they, he belongs to that generation of American musicians known as the Beboppers. Now, of course, the generation X people, some of them, not all of them, uh, identify with hip hop. So, I mean, you know, their generation is known as the Beboppers. So, when he wrote his autobiography, he called the autobiography To Be or Not To Bop. So, now if you read that book, you will see in his autobiography, D.C. Gillespie is saying that Islam attracted some of these African-American musicians for one reason. And of course, you have some of these musicians uh, who were Muslims, some of them became Baha'is, people like Cotrain. You see, now what is very interesting is that there is that connection between Islam and some of these musicians. And you find that some of these rappers now, even those who are not Muslims, 
If you see, some of them they take Muslim names, like Latifa. You see, Latifa will dangle a cross on her, around her neck. But she's not a Muslim, she's a Christian, but she changed her name to Latifa. And when they sing, they will say Allah, Allah, and all kinds. You see this on NTV. So what is very interesting is that there is that connection that developed during this fourth phase in terms of Islam and music within the African American community. And of course, the Dawood family, Seah Dawood, who started out as a musician with his wife Khadija, but then they discover Islam and they became actively involved. This couple would be the mothers and father of most of the Sunni Muslims among African Americans. Not a single Sunni African American Muslim group that came after them could not be linked intellectually and genealogically to the State Street Masjid. Because when they were younger, they used to go there. There was no other place for them to go. And they became linked to Sheikh Dawood Faisal, and afterwards many of them broke away. The Islamic Brotherhood Inc. of Brother Tawheek, Tawfiq in New York was part of Sheikh Dawood Faisal. The Darul Islam movement, which became a major movement among African Americans following Sunni Islam, was influenced by Sheikh Dawood Faisal. The Islamic Party of North America, which was headed by Musafruddin, was also influenced by Sheikh Dawood. Now, what is very interesting is that Sheikh Dawood, in his lifetime, tried to educate African Americans on Sunni Islam and was vigorously opposed to Elijah Muhammad. And then some of these African Americans who didn't go through the Nation of Islam were exposed to Sunni Islam by the students who were coming to America. And again, these Muslim students are children of the Cold War. Because of the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States, both contestants in the Cold War were trying to woo and win young people from the old world. The Russians at that time, in the height of their power, established a university in Moscow called Patrice Lumumba University. Asians, Africans, and Latin American kids went to study in that university. The United States government responded in kind. And America established a number of scholarship programs for young people. You have Experiment in International Living. You have Asia Society scholarships, Fulbright scholarships. Many of these young Muslim kids hundreds of thousands of them came to America as children of the Cold War. Now, many of these Muslim kids who were going to American colleges and universities would organize themselves into the Muslim Student Association, MSA. And many of these Muslim kids would end up marrying American brides. And this generation would create the foundation for Islam, because you have native-born American women and men who now begin to intermarry with these Muslim students who were the children of the Cold War. And of course, gradually, after 1963, you found in many American campuses Muslim student associations, and this would change the academy. Gradually, the Muslim kids following the footsteps of the Jewish kids, will now begin to ask for halal food in the cafeterias. And of course, many of them now begin to ask for space to pray. And of course, because the Cold War was going on, many of the American administrators on college campuses were up, applied to these students. And of course, many of these students came from politically volatile countries, and after they finished, they went home with their brides, American brides. But because of political trouble, they came back to America. And you have thousands of them who came. Some of them ended up not going back because of political crisis back in their countries, especially from the Middle East, and many of them also from Pakistan and some other Muslim countries in Africa. And these children of the Cold War would become students at one point, but then later on they will become professionals. And today, they form the backbone of the Muslim immigrant population in America. And 
This way, the marriages that were contracted by these children of the Cold War would give rise to native large number of American women who are Muslims, a smaller percentage of American men who marry some of these Muslim women from the Middle East or from Iran or some other points in the Muslim world now constitute the professional group within the Muslim community. And of course, many of the people who were identified with the nation of Islam and were willing to follow Imam Waridin Muhammad after 72, 75, within the span of 25 years, we now witness a middle class group emerging out of the old nation of Islam who are committed to Sunni Islam and to the American way of life. So you have the meeting of the two streams, those who came as children of the Cold War on American campuses, and those who came out of the ghettos of America, but were reformed and transformed by the Puritan ethics, as some scholars would say, of the nation of Islam, becoming middle class, mixing up with these immigrants and uh, white American Muslims and Chicana Muslims who, uh, uh, who have developed. So this is the, the, these are the meeting of the streams that you find in American society. You have the native born American Muslims and the immigrant Muslims converging and creating this new uh, 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 stream of American Islam. Now, this fourth phase has almost come to an end. There are still some aspects of it developing. But the fifth phase we are entering is the period of institutionalization and consolidation of the Muslim community. Because now, most American scholars and government officials have come to recognize that Islam is in the United States for good. It is not going to disappear. Muslims are here. And you have increasingly a large number of Americans native-born Americans who are Muslims. And most of the scholars, and the White House recognizes this, because they now invite Muslims to have Eid celebration in the White House. That's a major development in the United States. And of course, America can also use that for political purposes in the Muslim world. It cuts both ways. You legitimize the Muslims as part of the American way, but at the same time, you can talk, turn around and tell the Muslim world, you see? And Clinton did that when he addressed the parliament in Jordan. And he told the, uh, the Jordanian parliamentarians that we too hear the azan every day, and we too pray five times like you do. Meaning the American Muslims also pray like the Jordanians or the Arabs in the Middle East, because you do have American Muslims, they are citizens of America, but they share the same religion as those Middle Easterners or Muslims in the old world. That is part of the fourth, fifth phase, that what is now beginning to happen is that the Muslim presence in America is now evident, and you can develop a number of indices to measure this. One is the population growth. Now, most demographers and most national newspapers will tell you that there are at least five million Muslims in America. So this means to say that the Muslims are very much now part of the American cultural landscape. Second index is that Muslims are now creating schools to the point that this big debate going on within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as to school vouchers is not only the concerns of very orthodox Jews, very traditional Catholics, very traditional Protestants, but it's also an issue for Muslims. Because homeschooling or private schools for their children becomes an issue for the Muslims. So you can see that there are now a number of issues that develop in the American body politic which are also of significance to the Muslim community. And the Muslims are now becoming part of that discourse in American society. And if you read the literature, scholarly literature, you'll begin to see increasingly inclusion of Muslims whenever they talk about the Christian, the Jewish, and the Muslim phenomena in American society. This is being done by scholars and by journalists, and of course, by policymakers in the United States. Now, another index that is very interesting is the large number of mosques that are being constructed around the United States, 
to the point that you now have numerous mosques. There is not a single major American city today where you do not have a Muslim architectural presence in the form of a mosque. And in some of the big cities, you have many of these structures in place. So this is another interesting index by which to me measure the cultural presence of a religious minority. And of course, this is not true only of the Muslims. This is true also of the Hindus and the Sikhs in America and the Buddhists. But since we are talking about Muslims, we can begin to see that the geography of religion in America would now, the geographers, those who write books on geography of religion, will suddenly devote certain pages to Muslims as part of the American cultural landscape. An other index that is manifesting itself, and I alluded to that with respect to campus life, is the fact that halalization is beginning to take place. Just like causerization took place as Jews were beginning to be accepted. And of course the Hindus and their vegetative diet will also be beginning to be taken into account in American society. The same thing is becoming evident with regard to the Muslims, to the point that if you are flying on the airlines, you can tell them that you don't eat certain kind of food, and of course, they will try to find meals that accommodate your needs. And of course, the Muslims are now beginning to be taken seriously as part of the American cultural landscape through the creation of halal meat markets. And if you come from California, you have many of them. You come from Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. You come to New York, so many of them. So this is becoming a very interesting phenomena. Now, like all groups who immigrated into the United States, scholars who are urban, folklorists, or urban anthropologists, are also beginning to collect new data with regard to immigrant lives in American society. And of course, the presence of Muslim immigrants would be manifested not only in peddling, as we described earlier, but now increasingly you'll find Muslim, Muslim taxi drivers and Muslims working in all walks of life. And of course, one of the phenomena would be joking, jokes about the new kid on the block. And of course, you have on New York radio stations sometimes, they make jokes about the Muslim taxi drivers of New York City. You have many Pakistanis and others. I mean, you know, like, uh, and some of those. So that is an index, you see, of the presence of the other group. You see, where you now begin to have members of the mainstream culture talking about groups that are just recently arrived or are finding their way within the culture. So you have in the fifth phase in the development, institutionalization, whether it is in the form of the mosque or the, uh, the masajids, Islamic centers, uh, whether it's in the form of halal stores, whether it is in the form of bookstores that specialize in Islamic books, and they go with the halal stores, uh, in many parts of the uh, country. And now you begin to see with the development of the internet in America, you have many websites that are set up by Muslims to show their presence in America. Jokingly, I always tell people that America is the big magnifying mirror and everybody wants to be on that mirror to look big. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so the, the reality is the websites, the internet becomes a very interesting mirror. And of course, the presence of the immigrant communities as well as the old established communities is in the net. And Muslim websites demonstrate that American Muslims are now part of the American internet web. And of course, teachers as well as scholars like us who write about these things do not only supplement our books and other scholarly sources uh, with the net, but we also keep the old tradition of interviewing members of these communities so as to keep ourselves well posted with developments in their communities. One other point that needs to be emphasized also with regard to the institutionalization of Islam in America and the consolidation of the Muslim values in American society is the fact that all immigrants go through a period of assimilation and acceptance in the larger society. And of course, in America, you have five major institutions that are very key for 
groups that are immigrants and religions that are new, even though they are embraced by an increasing number of native-born Americans whose ancestors go back two, three hundred years ago in the country, one good index by which you can see that these religions are gaining acceptance in the society is in these five institutions of American society. The school system, and of course the public school system becomes the big mirror. You find that there are a lot of Muslim kids who are doing very well, and they have Muslim names, and they, some of them end up as valedictorians in some of these schools. And of course, this is an interesting development in American society. All the groups pass through this experience, Catholics, Jews, you know, Italians, and all the other groups, they went through that process in America. So the same thing will happen to the Muslim kids. They will go through this experience and with the teachers coming into the public school systems or going to private schools or whatever, they will go through this processing meal as other immigrant groups have gone through. And so the school system becomes very important. The universities also become very important. The second institutions that are very interesting in America would be the job market. And now you have Muslim institutions like CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, doing for the Muslims what the JDL did for the Jews when they were, and the Catholic Peace and Justice groups did for Catholics many decades ago, trying to make sure that these religious minorities were able to establish themselves in the American mainstream by taking litigious route. You know, because in America, one way of becoming part of the mainstream is to go to the courts. That's a legitimizer. Americans are the most litigious people on the planet. And uh, of course, one way of making sure that you belong is to go to court. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So that becomes very important. So part of the institutionalization of Islam is Muslim having their day in court, pressing their rights as citizens in the United States from the lowest courts to the Supreme Court. And this is happening. And of course, some of the employers, that's the third market going to work in the marketplace, where Muslims now try to go to get jobs. And of course, you get in the internet and in the newspapers battlegrounds where Muslims are pressing for their rights in America, very much like the blacks in the United States were doing 30 years ago, 40 years ago with NAACP fighting on behalf of the African Americans for their rights in the United States. So this phenomenon is beginning to take place in America. It's part of the institutionalization and the consolidation of Islam in the United States. An other area which is very important, part of the five institutional uh, 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 basis for acceptance in American society is the military. Now, of course, the Muslim immigrants who came fought in the World War I. Some of the popular had winners in World War I were Muslims who came out of Europe. We told you about the Polish Muslims, the Southern European Muslims. Some of those Muslims and some of the Arab Muslims, they won popular hearts. They fought for America in World War I. In World War II, there were many Muslims who were decorated who fought. Uh, now, of course, in those days, many of those Muslims, like other American ethnic groups who migrated to the United States, changed their names because the dominant paradigm in America at that time was Anglo conformity. And so Muslims in those days, just like Jews and other groups, changed their names so that they will look Anglo. So you may find a Muslim whose name is Muhammad Juma and he called himself Michael Friday. So I mean, you know, like, uh, I mean, because you see Michael Friday. I mean, you know, like, uh, that's a Muslim, Friday last name. I don't think many Anglo-Saxons carry names like Fridays. So I mean, you know, like, uh, but you find many of those Muslims who change their names. You see, and, uh, and, and you know, your name is Muhammad, but you know, Americans tend to abbreviate names, call me Mo. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, your name is Ali, call me Al. So, I mean, you know, like, uh, you have many of those things, but it's not peculiar to Muslims, it happens to other groups. I mean, you know, like the Greeks, they change their names. I mean, one way of showing that you arrive, I, you know, when I give lectures uh, in the universities, I say this, uh, that, uh, you know, one way of showing that the Greeks have made it in American society is in the Stephanopoulos. In the old days, Stephanopoulos would not go to the White House with Stephanopoulos. He would go as Stevens, George Stevens. But you see, I mean, Vice President Agnew, you know, like they changed their names. They were Agnupoulos. So they take Anglo names, Agnew. So I mean, you know, like uh, the Muslims, this is an index of 
being accepted in the American society. Because as the groups begin to get accepted, they can revert back to their old names. And because they are now established, the military becomes a very important equalizer for immigrants because they go into the military and the military is based on merit and ability to sacrifice for the homeland. And of course, now you find that there are thousands of Muslims in the US military. They didn't go there on draft because they're a voluntary army. They volunteered and they are in the military. So now you find that now the Pentagon people have accepted Muslim chaplains. And Muslim national organizations have been given the authority to recommend or nominate Muslims who are qualified to serve as chaplains, just like the Christian or the Jewish chaplains. This is part of the institutionalization process which is taking place in the United States. The last point I want to mention is the fact that in the United States, the academy also becomes a very important uh, place. And you now have many of these Muslim students who came from the Muslim world to come and study in the United States. And of course, when many of those students came, especially from the Middle East, when they had money to send thousands of students, the Shah of Iran, I mean, you have certain universities that thrive in America, likely because of the monies that were spent by these countries. George Washington University really became a major university thanks to the money from the Middle Eastern students. Because hundreds of them, if not thousands of them, came to study. That's millions of dollars. Georgetown University benefited immeasurably from this large number of students who came from the Muslim world. And they paid thirty, forty thousand $40,000 a year. That's a lot of money. I mean, if you have thousands of these students, you're talking about $40 million coming in. So that also became very interesting development in terms of institutionalization of Islam in America and the consolidation of the Muslim identity. So I will conclude by saying that if you look at the history of Islam in the United States, you will see that the five stages in the evolution of this community identify the periods in which Islam gradually came to the attention of American society. And this period goes before the founding of the Republic in 1776, and it continued to 1999. And of course, Muslims now are identified in almost all the states of the Union, but they are heavily concentrated in certain states, what are known as the big states of America, Texas, Los Angeles, I mean, I mean California, New York, Indiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, you know, those are, you know, you find them in Massachusetts, and uh, these are the areas where you find the Muslims. And of course, there are Muslims in the smaller states, even in Hawaii, I mean, far away there in the Pacific, you have find some small number of Muslims there, and in, even in Alaska, you have very small Muslims there, but they exist. So. The Muslims are now part of the American experience. And I think the scholars who write about them uh, in various outlets, either in the form of books dealing with American society, or in the form of books dealing with religions, or in the form of books dealing with ethnic groups in American society, are coming to appreciate this reality. Thank you very much. I hope I gave you enough. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, uh, you know, like uh, I assume the reason why I didn't talk about Darul Islam, I assume that you were already brief about Darul Islam as part of the larger Muslim experience. The Darul Islam Center here is part of the institutionalization process. If you look at the booklet that was prepared, tells you the origin of Darul Islam as a center that was conceived by one native-born American Muslim who encountered an Arab industrialist at the Kaaba. That's a very interesting meeting. And of course, you see, here you have an American Muslim who knew Islam before he met this Arab fellow. And as a result of their meeting, the idea of creating an institution like this one developed. And of course, since 1989, the leadership of this center here have new ideas as to how to go about uh, creating a center for learning about Islam. And of course, you have a piece of real estate around here, uh, which is controlled by the Darul Islam. And of course, this program here would be seen as part of the institutionalization effort of the Muslims, that you have Muslims in this part of the country who have friends around the country trying to create an institution where people, in this case teachers, can be given proper understanding of Islam in an academic setting where they can interact with scholars like myself and others who are teaching in American Academy about the same topic. You see what I'm saying? So you can see it as part of, yes, she can add some more to that. I was just going to say another thing that's interesting, not only with this organization, but with many of them, is doing workshops at conferences as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, 20 years ago, you would have seen a whole lot on Islam at NCSS. And now, you, the problem we have at NCSS is trying not to be against, up against each other in terms of the scheduling. There's so many different organizations. Mm -hmm. So besides bringing people in here, there's always outreach going out, not only with us, but with many organizations. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, thought, I was looking at this book in a bookstore about this, uh, religions of New Mexico. It mentioned that there had been a community of Afghans and Pakistanis in this area, but... <laughs> no, when you say, no, you have, okay, I think what you're referring to is, uh, in the, 18, in the 1860s, after the Civil War, uh, you had the U.S. Army recruited some Middle Easterners. Some scholars would say they were Afghans, because some of those people were taken to Australia as camelier trainers. So the U.S. Army introduced camels in this part of the world, <laughs> southwestern part of the United States, and they brought some of these cameliers. Now, the, the story is that some of these people, this, the data is conflictive among the scholars. The, that these Afghans, or people who came from uh, uh, that region of the Middle East, came to the United States uh, to help train U.S. soldiers in the use of the camel, just like they did with the British soldiers in Australia. Now, how this story became part of the military folklore in America is that the fellow who was recruited was known as Haji Ali. Haji Ali. And in terms of American military folklore, there is Hi Jolly, which is one of the military songs in the US military. Hi Jolly. So I mean, you know, like they sing it. The military, American military still sing that. But it's a distortion of Haji Ali's name. Hi, Jolly. So I think that is where that idea of that there were some people who came to, the, to this part of the world uh, uh, developed. And, and it's part of that folklore that has developed in, in American history. These are sm you see, I mean, history is a very interesting thing. I mean, you know, like you have, as I told you, some history become footnotes. But as people begin to focus more on it, it becomes part of the main text. Through the middle of Kansas, sometimes, if you drive up to say the Fort uh, Oh Green, I just forgot Leavenworth, right? There are herds of camels out on the, hmm. the hills of the Kansas. Yeah, you see. Okay, yeah. so you see, so you, are, you can see that that history is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other question? <laughs> yeah, American history is very rich. You know, you know, like we cannot ex exhaust it. Yeah. Over the states that have the largest Muslims. Yes. Yeah, you have Texas. 
New York, California, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Indiana, Maryland. You can add Maryland. Well, Virginia. Well, Virginia, yes, Virginia also. They have, oh, they have a lot of them in Virginia. In Northern Virginia, you have many. So, I mean, these are the states any U.S. president would like to win, to be president anyway. I mean, because, you know, like, uh, the, the, that's why, you know, like, you have, uh, the, I think the immigrants go to these areas because you have more job opportunities. These are the biggest. You see, California alone has almost one-fifth of the U.S. population, you see. So, I mean, you know, like, uh, you can see that, yeah. So, is there a, a lobby? Uh, yeah, 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 part of the, part of the, Part of the uh, consolidation, institutionalization, consolidation is the emergence of Muslim organizations like the American Muslim Council, which does lobbying on Capitol Hill. And uh, they invite politicians, they interact with other groups, trying to form coalition with various American groups. Uh, you have uh, Muslim groups like uh, the Islamic Society of North America, which is not a political group, but it is a major organization of Muslims, and they engage dialogue in, with Christian groups, Protestant and Catholics, and with Jewish groups around the country. So you have those groups uh, that are in the country that are interested in engaging the other religious groups. So you have interfaith dialogue, which is now being institutionalized in certain Muslim communities. The, some communities are more advanced than others. Some Muslim communities are more advanced in engaging their counterparts in the other religious communities than others. And that's one of the reasons why I have argued in my own writings and in my book, Islam in the United States of America, that the Muslim community could be divided into three groups. And I think these three groups exist in all the other religious communities because of moderni modernization and post-modernization. You have what I call the grasshopper Muslims, uh, the grasshoppers. You know, they follow the green grass so that they are almost indistinguishable. I mean, you find counterparts in other groups. They become very assimilated to the point that you don't really know their religious affiliation at all. They become very, almost secular humanists. They don't, you don't know their religious identity at all. You can know them for many years, but you don't really know what they are. And you have Muslims like that. And uh, many of them change their name, so there's no way you can tell they are Muslims. Now, the, you have uh, what I call the oysters. Uh, you know, like, uh, the, these are very much like the very orthodox ultra-Orthodox Jews, you know, in New York, and the Amish Christians that you find in Western Maryland, in Indiana, and in Pennsylvania, who cut themselves, the Mennonites, they cut themselves off from the mainstream to maintain their own distinct Christian lifestyle. So you have Muslims like that. I mean, so then you have the third group, what I, what I call the middle group. They try to live between these two extreme positions. These are what I call the owls. Now, you know, like the owl Muslims. You know what I mean? You know, the, the owl Muslims are deliberately named after the owl because in the West, the owl is the bird of wisdom. But the sociology of birds in the Muslim world is very negative towards owls. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But, you know, you have these three groups, the grasshoppers, the oysters, and the owls. And, of course, the institutionalization process, which is taking place among Muslims, reflect these different tendencies. Yes, please. Um, how do you think the, um, the this recent, uh, well, past 25 years um, events in the Middle East with the oil crisis and then the various conflicts between um, Palestinians and Israelis and all that kind of stuff has affected the perception of, of all of America towards Muslims in, in the United States and also around the world? Yes, uh, you do have uh, perceptual uh, questions uh, with regard to Muslims in America. Uh, the Palestinian crisis, the Arab-Israeli conflict, because the, the kernel of the Arab-Israeli conflict is the Palestinian question. And that has been the cause of tension, not only between Jews and Arabs, but American supporters of Israel and the Muslim world. You see, and this has manifested itself in a number of ways in American society. Uh, you have pro-Israeli groups that are very uh, suspicious of Arabs and Muslims, and of course, they feel that any inroad on the part of the Arabs or Muslims 
is detrimental to their long-term interest, long interest. That that's one. The other thing is you have some of the members of the Christian coalition who have a millenarian idea about Israel, and you know, like the last days, Armageddon, and the like. So they see Islam as uh, uh, as a stumbling block for the fulfillment of prophecy because Jerusalem becomes very critical in their consciousness. So that is one issue that uh, needs to be understood as a source of tension. The third point that needs to be addressed here really is the whole question of the peace talks and the kind of backlash that developed in the Middle East as a result of the lack of peace between Israelis and Arabs. So long as you have lack of peace between Israelis and Arabs, you will continue to have a large number of Palestinians who are very desperate, very frustrated, and who are willing to do anything and everything to advance their own cause. And of course, they have other Muslims who are sympathetic to them, and those Muslims would also do what Palestinians would do out of desperation. That's one reason why the peace process becomes very important, not only for Palestinians and Israelis, Jews and Muslims, but for all Americans. Because so long as the Israelis are fighting with the Arabs, especially Palestinians and the Israelis, you will not have peace. And terrorism, as it is understood in the international community today, would continue to be a major source of fear in Arab-Jewish relations, Israeli-Muslim relations, American-Muslim relations. And American Muslims, who do not have anything to do with that, because they live here, will be the victims of that kind. And they become victimized, very much like during Second World War, German-Americans and Japanese were suspected to being collaborators guilt by association. And that's the reality we face in America. Yes, please. Yeah, 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 yeah go ahead, yes. Okay. Um, I understand that uh, the, the mainstream Islamics, uh, Sunni Muslims in America would look at, at uh, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam as heretical. How would Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam look at Sunni Muslims? Well, I mean, uh, it, that's a good question. Uh, that's a very good question because that kind of question is not usually asked. People always try to see how deviant is Farrakhan from mainstream Islam. But the question that you raise, you see, here you go to the sociology of the Afro-America. The nation of Islam philosophy really is the mirror opposite of the Christian identity movement. I don't know whether you're familiar with that movement. The Christian identity movement is basically in the Midwestern part of the country. You may find some fringe elements in the Northwestern part of the United States. These are white Americans who see Christianity in racist terms. And of course, the nation of Islam is the mirror opposite of that. I mean, the nation of Islam, that's why I say that I will reserve for the question answer period the theology of the nation of Islam. There are a lot of Americans who don't really understand the theology of the nation of Islam. Maybe they never heard about it. But if you read people like C. Eric Lincoln, who is an African-American Christian, who wrote his dissertation many years ago in Boston uh, on the nation of Islam, and many other books that have been written about the nation of Islam, you will get the theology of the nation of Islam. The theology runs like this. Unlike the Christians or the Jews or the Muslims who believe in monogenesis, that all humans came from Adam and Eve, they have a polygenesis theory of origins. They believe that a black scientist by the name of Yakub created white people. And that, you know, like uh, on the moon, that's part of their theology. That may be very weird to Americans, but it's the theology of the nation of Islam. And they teach their followers that white people are devils because this black scientist called Yakub created this mutant creature who has been given a 6,000 years to rule. And in terms of their conception and their in, uh, cosmology, the 6,000 years are running out. That's what they believe. And you know, like, uh, the, 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 the many people hear about Farrakhan, but they don't understand their belief system. Now, the nation of Islam is heretical because that is not an Islamic teaching. Islam shares the same theological premise as the Christian and Jewish faith, that all humans are children of Adam and Eve and that they have a brief appointment in this life 
and they will die. And of course, this is more true of Christians and Muslims that on the day of judgment, they will be resurrected and they'll be judged for what they have done on this earth. One other point of div divergence between the nation of Islam and Orthodox Islam, and Farrakhan would say the Orthodox Muslims are either deceived by the white people in the United States or they are bewitched to the point that they accept their lies and distortions because if they know the truth, Farrakhan style, they would not be fooled by the devil because for them, white people are devils. And uh, so in their conception, uh, the, 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 the Muslim Americans from especially immigrants, and they say it. These immigrants are fools, they don't know the truth. So I mean, you know, like, if they know the truth, they will be like us. That's what they teach their followers. So they feel that the Muslim immigrants from Pakistan, from the Arab world, from Africa, from Bosnia or anywhere else, who want to be part of American society are really misguided and they are not given proper understanding of reality. So they have this notion that uh, uh, Farrakhan will teach his followers. They, if you buy their paper, the final call, you read the back of their paper, you will see it there, it's stated clearly. That's their belief system. Yes, please. So do they, they only, I don't know, I want to relate, but do they only have um, prejudice against white people or is it any, anyone that's not black? Well, no, they're against, uh, uh, for them really, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, their, in their cosmology, there are only two races. Black and white. So anyone who is not Caucasian is... Yeah, I mean, they would say that the Chinese and all those people, they're just really uh, misguided. That, 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 you see, the, the theology is of the nation of Islam is very strange to many Americans. But that's their theology, yes. And you see, uh, and the Orthodox Muslims find themselves at loggerheads with the nation of Islam philosophy because it negates orthodox Islam. You see, because in orthodox Islam, evil is identified with the devil. Just like in Christianity, Satan or Lucifer or Belzebub as in Catholic terminologies. But you see, in there they have racialized evil in their conception. Now, that was one thing that Malcolm X realized towards the end of his life, and he changed from that old conception to accept Orthodox Islam. Now, there are some people who are saying that Farrakhan is moving away from that, but personally, I'm very suspicious. I don't see the evidence beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, he has to come out, like Malcolm did, and say, I was mistaken and I accept Orthodox Islam. Now, if he does that, the Muslims will embrace him as somebody who repented for his sins and his sirk. Because the moment you begin to elevate a human being to the status of God in Islam, you're committing sirk. That is making partnership with God. And that is the greatest sin you can commit as a Muslim or as a human being. You see, and that is one of the fundamental disagreement between Islam and any other religion that does not believe in one God only. And making God, by developing a polygenesis understanding of human origins, and then at the same time racializing it, the nation of Islam is taboo among Orthodox Muslims. And that's why Farrakhan is a theological leper among Muslims. Yeah. Any other question? Well, I think I can say thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>